Hey folks, uh, uh, this is another research notebook video. Uh, I haven't done one of these in years and years, uh, uh, but I have a point. I mean, because most of my videos are happening over on the T2 Tile channel now, uh, but I have some stuff that I've been working through this robust local synchronization idea that uh, has some kind of interesting stuff, I thought, uh, and I thought I would take a little bit of extra time and try to present it research notebook style. It still will probably be kind of long and kind of confusing, but uh, hopefully it will be of value. In the very least, it will just be helping to document the arc of my own thinking as well as uh, uh, project and design development. All right, so uh, um, a little background as quickly as possible, you know, uh, so the idea of synchronizations, everything worked together. And in digital computing, it was the heart and soul of the digital computer revolution that the original CPU and RAM, the whole model, there was a clock and the clock had to be distributed to all the circuit elements that were involved and it had to reach them all at pretty much the same time so that when each individual circuit element decided what next state it should adopt based on the things it's connected to, the things that it was connected to would all be showing their results from the previous state. And then, chunk, the clock comes and everybody updates their state and things all go crazy all over the world. But then it settles down and then the next clock edge comes and so forth. So globally clocked architecture has been the, the backbone that has powered the whole computer revolution, basically in terms of the individual machine. And when you have that, the goal is to get this single deterministic execution path. The idea being that, you know, once you know the previous, the current states of all the uh, things that are input to you, and then you get the clock edge, you produce a guaranteed output that, you know, I am the and of my inputs or the or of my inputs or the sum of my inputs, whatever it is. Uh, um, and as a result, because each individual step happens on the absolute beat of the clock, boom, 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 uh, um, and each each individual step is absolutely predicted by the previous step, the, pro the prediction of the entire program overall is also absolutely predicted deterministic execution. Now, the bigger the number of circuit elements that you've got, the harder it is to actually get the, the clock out to all of them all at once. I mean, even if you have a, you know, a clock in the town square and in, in the, in the church going ding, 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 it takes time for sound to spread from the, from the bell over the whole village. And so the bigger the village is, the less synchronization you've got. And as chips and circuits and computers have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, they've actually gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, but as they've gotten smaller and smaller, they have more villagers on the more individual elements that need to hear about the clock distributing the clock signal to everybody uh, has become more and more of a problem and uh, more and takes up more and more real estate more and more energy and so forth so much so that most of the uh, the computers smartphones and so forth that you deal with these days actually are not no longer globally, single globally clocked. Instead, they're what's called globally asynchronous, locally synchronous. And, and what it means is they have a bunch of, you know, sub-villages. They have a bunch of small clock domains that there's a clock for the CPU and the, there's a clock for the memory and there's a clock for the communication buses running between them. But the clocks, those clocks are not co coordinated uh, as some higher master level by anybody. So that instead now, when you have one clock domain meeting another clock domain, you have to have a synchronization border. You have to have some additional mechanism to deal with the fact that this one might be halfway through a tick while this one is now firing. And, you know, if you just let this side look at the signals on that side, they would get chaos. So there's all this extra stuff that you build in between the clock domains to add additional synchronization. But still, in the spirit of single deterministic execution, the machines that we build today using GALs, globally essential local signatures, uh, are designed so that even though the uh, different clock domains may technically be running at different clocks, and so this guy might get a couple extra clocks in before this one gets a clock, and it might be different, different times we ex execute the program. We design the whole thing so that you still get a deterministic result, hopefully, once the program is done. Now, I hated all of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I started out in computing in the 70s, and it was great fun, and I, I learned tons and worked on it for decades. Uh, uh, but eventually, this whole control freak, top down, everybody do what I say or else do nothing, I got tired of it. It, it really, you know, 
it seems number one it was kind of played out and number two it was a security nightmare and number three it just wasn't very much fun anymore and it seemed like there was many more aspects of computation that really weren't covered by the top-down king of the universe i'm the best just do what i say sort of attitude and so the whole best effort uh, computing thing that i've been pushing on for the last decade or two as well as the robust first stuff that, that leads to this video that's happening right now is all about saying let's give up on the deterministic result we'll give up on the deterministic execution path so now hardware and software both are going to have to be able to deal with failures and deal with stuff coming and going and disappearing and still do somehow make some useful progress so the suggestion is you know the past was single globally determinist globally clocked architecture now we have multiple clocks but we're simulating a, a deterministic result in the future we're going to give up and we're going to need a robust local sync and that's what i want to talk about today uh, um okay so if we're giving up on a global clock what do we replace it with well one candidate to replace it is this thing called an asynchronous cellular automata and that's what the movable feast that i talked about in the demon horde sword video and the whole tz tile project is all about uh, is, you know, a spatially array, a spatially distributed array of very simple processing elements that do not have a global clock. They do not go ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk all at once. Instead, they fire off sort of at random, or we don't even know how they fire off, but we do a little work so that when this guy is looking at his neighbors, there's nobody else also looking at those neighbors. Now, if we start with something like that, and how are we going to compute with it? It's a whole different picture, and that's what the T2 Dial project has been about. But there was this one particular idea saying, you know, well, I have a trick. I have an idea. I'm smart, saying how I could take this asynchronous cellular time, events flying all over the place, and synchronize it so that we can get rid of the asynchronousness, and now we can get back to a ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Everybody can look at what their neighbors used to be and decide what they want to be now at the same time, in quotes. And uh, this is an idea that goes back to Nakamura in 1974, has been reinvented a couple of times since. I am just going to call it the NTN algorithm, Nakamura, Toffoli, Nahana, uh, um, and uh, let it go there. And I'm going to talk about a slightly simplified version of it. And the basic idea, the most important part about it is there's this th sort of three-state loop, which I'm going to call red, green, blue is typically what it is. And we use this idea to say, how do we synchronize an asynchronous CA is we have each individual little site is going to look at its neighbors. So each site is going to be a color, red, green, or blue at the moment. And it looks to the neighbors and lets the neighbors catch up with it. And so here's the picture. Uh, uh, if uh, we're in state red, we look at our neighbors, and if we have no blue neighbors, that means everybody's caught up, we can move on to green. And if we're in green and we have no we have no red neighbors down here, we can move on to blue. If we're in blue and we have no green neighbors, we can move on to red. Okay, so if uh, I'm sitting in red, say, and I have a blue neighbor, that means someone hasn't caught up, and I cannot make that. Whoops, that way I cannot make the transition. Okay, so if everybody obeys this rule, uh, then we, we can get this cycling going. So let's take a look at an example here. Uh, um, all right. Uh, uh, okay, so here we've got a grid full of stuff. Uh, um, I am going to flood the world with uh, uh, this stuff. Let's get rid of these labels. And, all right, so here we are. Now, uh, suppose so they're all blue at the moment and so so the rule for blue said uh, uh the rule for blue says if there's no green neighbors i can move on well so this blue fellow here he can move on so he becomes red now red can't move on uh, um, until there's no blue neighbors and in fact he's got all blue neighbors so even if we click on him again nothing happens but if we click on the neighbors they have no they have they have no green neighbors, so they can make the blue to red transition, and and you see how it all spreads out. And now these guys in here, like this guy here, he's got no blue neighbors, so he can make the transition from red to green, and so on. And we can spread this out a little bit more uh, uh, here. And now this guy in the middle, he's got no red neighbors, and he can make the transition back to blue. So you see how it works. And if we just let it rip. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of trippy, uh, um, but 
Uh, uh, you see what it's doing. Uh, uh, there's, oh, there's the edge of it. Okay. Uh, um, we have uh, red chasing blue, green chasing red, blue chasing green. And it's kind of zooms in on random little spots that just because of chance happen to be taking longer. And so that's the guy that we have to wait for. Uh, uh, but then they catch up and we move on. It's a nice trick. So uh, uh, what can we do with this? Uh, um, so this is the principle of always wait for your neighbors. Now, the first thing to think about this is, you know, when we talked about global clocking, it's not like everybody here went from green to blue at the same time. Far from it. I mean, there, so, you know, this blue, this blue, this blue, these various blues are not even necessarily the same step in the computation uh, unless you actually traced it all around like sort of, you know, contour lines on a, a map, an elevation map. All right. So. The NTN algorithm does more than just the wait for the neighbor cycling. That's the backbone of it. But if we're going to be able to update uh, synchronously, in effect, synchronously, we have to do more. And so the idea is, instead of just having my internal state that other people can look at, I have two copies of it. I have my internal information that nobody but me can see, and then I have my published information that's out in the world. And we deal with it on different transitions. So when we make the red to green transition, we update our internal state, uh, but we don't tell anybody about it. And then when we make the green to blue uh, uh, transition, we tell everybody about it. Now, why is that a, a safe? Well, because the cool idea is when we make the green to blue transition, we know there are no red neighbors. So that means we haven't got anybody who's in the process of computing their internal state at the time we are updating ours. And then finally, on the blue to red state, we just do nothing. We wait. That's essentially just to keep things separated so that we can tell which way is forward. And that's the trick. So it takes twice as much state because we have to remember both our internals and uh, the stuff that we've published. When we update our uh, internals on the red to green transition, we look at everybody else's published state. So even if we see it at a different time than somebody else, we know that nobody has updated based on our stuff because that will only happen on a green to blue transition. See? Very tricky. Okay, and now once we've done that, we can make a whole new set of rules, a sort of virtual universe on top of the physical universe, uh, uh, taking advantage of the synchronous rules. And we can do that here as well. So let's flood the universe again. Uh, uh, okay, but now let's change the display. Uh, 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 what do I want? I want Adam number one here on the back and Adam number two in the middle. Okay, so now. Of course, <laughs> uh, uh, Dave in a snowstorm. Uh, uh, so now you see the background is all blue, and that's because that's the they're all in state blue in terms of the red, green, blue cycling. But the front is all white because they're all in the synchronous universe. They are all uh, white ones. So now if I make some a uh, little pattern like that, say, okay, and if we let it go, it's kind of cool the way it works. So you can still see, hopefully, the red, green, blue cycling happen in the background. But now on top of this, there's this whole black and white thing going on. And so the rules that are happening in the synchronous universe here are uh, the Con Conway's Game of Life. Uh, certainly the most famous, I'm pretty sure, that, yeah, absolutely the most famous cellular automata set of rules. Uh, and this particular pattern is called the glider. Uh, uh, it's the most famous pattern in the game of life. And it's, you know, five little black states that essentially toggles back and forth between an L shape and a zigzag shape made out of four. And then one thing in the back that kind of zooms back and forth, driving the whole thing forward. And, you know, and th this thing is working fine. And, you know, pretty soon it's actually going to get up to the top of the universe here. A and... Um, it's going to turn into a block because that's what uh, gliders tend to do when they run into the edge of the universe. And, and there it did. And there it is. Turned into a block. And so now the synchronous universe is still updating. The asynchronous universe is still updating, but nothing's actually happening. Uh, uh, so that's really cool. And that was the basis of the Berkeley prof who was thinking, you know, hey, we can just continue to do synchronous cellular automata like Conway's Game of Life and use the NTN trick underneath to... <clears throat> uh, 
just deal with the asynchronous business and not worry about it. Uh, uh, but that's fine as far as it goes. Uh, uh, but now the question comes up, if the point of the making an architectural decision that we're going to get rid of asynchronous CAs entirely and use the NTN -end trick to present a synchronous universe so that programmers only have to deal with synchronous stuff, then we have to say, okay, well, how big is this synchronized universe going to be? And in the cellular, uni cellular automata, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what if something goes wrong? We haven't talked about it, but sooner or later, if we make the thing bigger and bigger, bigger, something will go wrong. So let's hit it with an X-ray. We got a little button to simulate that. And what happened? Uh -uh. Well, we lost some of our some of our universe. Just got blown out entirely. Those aren't black states. Those are actually holes in the universe. We'd like some way to fix those, but we don't have it. I mean, let's hit it again. Uh uh. And now look at this. The entire universe has come to a halt. Why is that? Well, let's take a look. Uh, um, so here's our rules again. But what if you happen to come up with a state where the red guy, if he's looking in a little three by three box, if that's what he thinks neighbors are, um, he says, can red go to green? He has no blue neighbors. He's got a blue neighbor, so he can't go to green. And green needs no red neighbors, but he's got a red neighbor, so he can't go to blue. And symmetrically, blue can't go to red unless he has no green neighbors. Each one has a neighbor of the other two colors mutually in the same neighborhood. So none of these three can advance. So it's a deadlock. Now, see, one of the big tricks was when I started this up, I flooded the whole universe with blue. I mean, it didn't matter. I could have flooded it all with red or flooded it all with green. But the point is, it's all the same color. So there's no cases of all three colors mutually in the same neighborhood when I started it up. And as long as you follow the rules like this, none of these states will ever come up. But if there's any possibility of failure, you get screwed so bad that the entire universe, the entire synchronous universe, grinds to a halt. And that's what we're looking at here exactly. If we look in close here, actually, if we change the middle, okay. Uh, uh, there it is right there. Green, red, and blue, all within a uh, neighborhood of each other, so nothing can move on like that. And, you know, I could try to fix this up. I mean, you know... Well, let's not take the time, because the point is, the only way I can fix this up is by using my bigger knowledge, not just looking at the local neighborhood about where the problems are and say, OK, well, if I could color this one red, then this little problem would go away. And that might be true, but there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is, is that, you know, in the synchronous universe, has that transition happened or not? I mean, the reason it mattered we were relying on these transitions in order to tell us when to do the updates. And supposedly in the architectural world, we were going to guarantee that the uh, synchronous universe was going to update deterministically. And even if we could repair the RGB looping that uh, caused deadlock there, we cannot reconstruct what the state of the synchronous universe was supposed to be. So bottom line, uh, uh, deterministic architectural sync, this idea of we don't have to worry about asynchronous because we'll just use NTN and get back to synchronous and everybody will be happy, fails. Uh, uh, and so the general idea of that, you know, we, w we started out using global clocking, but it was just small little computers. And as the computers got bigger, we went to multiple clock domains and interfaces between them, but we tried to produce uh, the effect of simulated global sync. The NTN idea is another way to produce simulated global sync, and it just doesn't scale up. As you scale up, eventually there will be a failure somewhere. And in this case, the cost of the failure is the end of the universe. So. Let's change the game. And that's what this is all about. That, you know, if we're saying no, we're not going to make a, we're not going to decide for the programmer to present, you know, to, to hide the nastiness of the asynchronous world. We're going to let that come through. Uh, uh, but we can still make additional tools that will help the programmer uh, get things done. 
you know, so like I said, I started out thinking, you know, sync is evil. Don't sync. Everybody should just do whatever they feel and, you know, be, you know, anarchist hippies and everything will be fine. And that's great. But then as I worked through uh, the T2 tiles and, and started programming more and more complex stuff. Then, you know, you figure out pretty quickly that if you want to do something bigger than yourself, then you need to be able to coordinate with whoever you're working together with. And that's a form of synchronization. And so the idea is, is that what you should do is synchronize however much you need to get whatever job you're doing done and don't synchronize more than that. So because synchronization has these significant inherent costs. So synchronize as much as you need to get the job done and no more. And that's the idea of local sync, program sync. And so that's different than assuming it's going to be done as a deterministic architectural assumption. In particular, if we know that we're programming a local synchronized area, then there will be edges, there will be corners. We know the thing at any given moment is going to be finite, and we can take advantage of that in a way that the deterministic architectural sync that was saying, I'm completely open-ended, all you have to do is tell me about the neighbors and I can do with it, can't do. So we can do a different design approach that exploits the fact that we're doing finite uh, programmed sync so that we can take advantage of errors. I'm sorry, take advantage of edges. We might take advantage of errors. So in particular, what I've done is I say, here's the approach. Let's take whatever we're dealing with and somehow define a notion of upstream and downstream and build a coordination mechanism on top of there's a headwaters of the stream and there's the end of the stream at the ocean, whatever it is, and they need to talk. That's the coordination thing. All right, so let's look at the second example here. I'll get rid of this guy over there here. Uh, okay, so let's get, uh, all right, get this guy going. All right, get rid of the labels again. So, well, well first we'll just let this guy run a little bit so you see what it does. Uh, uh, red, green, blue, yellow uh, uh, and then back again so it's doing some kind of cycling it's, it seems like it's a four stroke engine rather than the three uh, cycle uh, of the antenna algorithm but let's see what's going on uh, uh, if we look inside these guys uh, um, one here and one here get them up out of the way uh, uh, and what i want to call your attention to is right at the bottom if you can see it Got this thing called Ringo state that has an M up state that's false here, and M down state that's true. And then over at the end, we've got M up state true and true. And so now what happens is, well, uh, if we, uh, all right, so here, here we go. So now if I do an event here, this is the end of the stream. This is downstream. So I do an event here, and now we the up state is false and the down state is true. And the idea of the rule is, is the, the, uh, tail, the most downstream uh, being, says, you know, I want my downstate to be the same as my upstate. I am an empathic. I want to support you. You say false, I will say false. And so his downstate changes to false. And now it works its way back up, and eventually it gets up to here. And the head, the root of upstream, the source of the stream, uh, discovers that they're false. But the root of the tree is a jerk. The, <laughs> the tree wants the upstate to be different than the downstate. So it goes back to true. And then we go back down and so on. So what's happening is the head of the, of the tree, the root of the tree, is saying, I want my upstate to be different than the downstate. The tail of the tree is saying, I want my downstate to be equal to my upstate. And everybody in the middle is saying, I don't want to be involved in it. If the upstate, if the guys upstream of me say, I'm just going to listen to what the upstream says about the upstate. I'm going to listen to what the downstream says about the downstate and stay out of it otherwise. And so that's what we get. So now the jerk keeps flipping things so that they be different. That goes heads downstream and the empath switches to make it uh, match and it goes upstream and we get this local clock that automatically runs between whatever counts as the root of the top and whatever counts as the bottom. That's the idea. Empath and the jerk. Uh, uh, and, you know, I implement these things and... <laughs> 
You know, it's always the last step. I mean, I actually implemented this idea of having one side that, you know, a communicating pair where one of them always wants things to be different and the other side always wants them to be the same and they keep going back and forth in an oscillation. That's actually what the T2 tiles, the actual T2 tiles use to communicate with each other across intertile connectors. Well, one side, the north, north, uh, northeast or set north, northeast, uh, sorry, the well, three of the connectors are the upstream guy. The other three connectors are the downstream guys. So whenever you put two of them together, you get one upstream and one downstream. And one is trying to match and the other one's trying to mismatch. As a result, they share a clock between them and that's how they communicate information through the intertile connectors. So it was only in the last month that I finally figured out what I had implemented first uh, using the on the T2 tiles themselves and then in uh, software that I was just showing you. And it's what's called a ring oscillator. And a ring oscillator is a signal loop with an odd number of inverters. So, you know, here's, so this has got four elements in it, but this only got one uh, little circle on it. That's the inverter. The rest of them are just buffers that just copy the signal from one to the output. So if we power this thing up, who knows, maybe this thing sees a one on its input, just as kind of random. So he copies it to its output and so on. It gets all the way up to the one that actually is the inverter. The inverter says, okay, my input's a one, therefore my output's a zero, and the buffer copies it. Well, that means now the one that used to be zero, one is now zero, and it just goes around and around. So this is exactly what we saw, uh, or, or very similar to what we saw uh, um, in the uh, demo that we just looked at, uh, uh, where the root, the upstream, the head, is the jerk. The jerk is the inverter. And everybody else is just trying to say, okay, whatever you say, whatever you say, like that. Uh, um, and, and so it works fine. Um, and uh, ring oscillators get used for all sorts of actual, you know, in low level electronics, they get used to actually make clocks and to synchronize different clock domains, all kinds of things. So this is a software ring oscillator is what I've made. <laughs> That's what, it, what the way to call it. So, and, you know, just to make sure we understand, you know, so what's wrong with having an even number of oscillators? So now we got a circle here and a circle here uh, um, and we clock it and that's what's wrong with it. It doesn't actually oscillate. A signal loop with an even number of oscillators doesn't ring. It's a memory. Oh, and that's one point actually uh, about the name ring oscillator. Uh, there's an ambiguity in the word ring. <laughs> you can fall a foul up. It means both the idea of ring like a wedding ring. It's a loop. Uh, uh, and also ring like a bell, ring like a wedding bell, uh, where it goes blah, 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 because it's ringing because it's going one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Depending on context, the ring and ring oscillator might mean the fact that the signal is going around a ring, or it might mean that the behavior of the signal rings up and down between one and zero. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. But... In the general case, uh, I'm dealing with things that are not necessarily just an individual line, but they are, uh, you know, arbitrary shapes. And how are we going to define upstream and downstream if there's more than one thing that's upstream? And what I use is I just say, don't copy, wait until upstream all agrees. If upstream all agrees on what the value of upstate is, copy it. If downstream all agrees on the state of what downstream is supposed to be, copy that. Otherwise, just stay with where you were. And we can take a quick look at it. Oh, it's taking so long. Uh, we'll take a quick look at it because it's kind of what the point is. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, all right, we'll get rid of these guys. Uh, uh, we'll start over and we'll make a seed ringo. Uh, we will make a seed. Uh, uh, oh, that's the line that we just did. What we, what we want is a, here we go. All right. Uh, uh, so now we're doing uh, the same, exact same algorithm, except now everybody that's either above us or west of us, north of us or west of us, that's our upstream. Everybody who's east or south of us is downstream. And anybody that's on our same row or column is neither upstream nor downstream. So we don't look at them. Uh, um, 
and we insist on unanimous consent. Uh, everybody upstream says uh, true, I take true for upstate and so on. And this is fantastically robust. So, you know, let's hit it with some x-rays. Uh, uh, can't see squat. Uh, uh, let's get the, the x-ray tool here. Uh, uh, okay, well, I killed the <laughs> I killed the plate. There's an underlying plate that's doing this, but we can actually make it get more robust than that. Uh, if we make uh, uh, all right, so this is you know this is beyond uh, uh, okay. So this is what's called an L2 plate. But uh, so now if these guys individually, they're still using and look at this. They're using the Ringo ring oscillator all the way ultimately from this uh, state up here uh, um, all the way down to this tail down here. And they've got tons of other things going on. They're much more complicated, but still in the middle there, you can find the upstate and the downstate uh, are working exactly the same way. And the root is trying to make them different while the tail makes them be the same. Uh, um, and, you know, this thing, we can, we can just plow all kinds of problems through it. Uh, um, and it recovers extremely well because number one, the uh, the little individual plates are sort of you know replaceable, and the neighbors rebuild them. But the key for this, and this is what was works with the Ringo approach that did not work with the NTN approach, is that the red, green, blue cycling uh, recovers like that. And even if we do something worse, like we you know just put a big old blob in the middle of it, uh, paint a you know something like this uh, all right there's something like that <laughs> you know so we actually you know made a big mess out of it uh, um, now you can see what's happening here is in this case uh, this particular square right here it's got no upstream uh, nobody upstream of it that counts the the white wall is not relevant so it doesn't count so it, in fact, now becomes one of the jerks. It, in fact, says, oh, I want to have my up be opposite to the down. And this guy over here also thinks he is uh, the root because he's got nobody above him. So he also thinks about it. So, you know, with this big block just tearing a hole in our, in our program, in our big data structure, uh, we... Uh, end up thinking that we've got two roots, which is bad, and depending on exactly what we're going to do with it, it might be terrible. But it doesn't even spread, because now because we use the consensus rule, so there. So we saw this, this, all right, so that's gone green, but nothing else happens. So it goes red real quick, but it doesn't spread further. So once we get far enough, far enough into it where we don't see unanimity, then the guys in the middle, they wait for consensus. They wait for unanimous from the upstream and go. So this still does the right thing. And my feeling these days is this approach, the ring oscillator approach, the generalized distributed ring oscillator is so robust, so naturally, spatially, sensibly robust. Uh, let's get rid of this guy. Um, that, uh, you know, if, whether you like it or not, uh, um, this makes sense to be the definition of what a distributed shared local clock does. And, you know, okay, if there's a risk of it having multiple routes, then that we're going to present that in the programmer's documentation for how to deal with it, rather than try to pretend we know best, we can force synchronization, we can guarantee everything. No, what we want to do is reflect reality in a way that makes sense. And this, the empath and the jerk, I like it a lot. Okay. So yeah, and so and then once again, when I finally do the related work, when I finally study stuff in order to, for example, make this video, uh, uh, this uh, the idea of don't update your state until every all your inputs agree. Uh, uh, it's called a C element. It goes back to 1955. It was first used in the Iliad II computer and so on and so forth. And I love that. I, th I just think it's great because, and, and now, okay, you know, it was used there. It's used in the T2 tile hardware signaling. And now it's used again in the Ringo uh, protocol that I've just developed in the last month. 
And, you know, on the one hand, I used to think, uh, um, you know, that's bad. Uh, I, I'm reinventing the wheel instead of reusing it. But now I'm convinced, no, it's actually right. That that's what we want to be doing at each scale level. We want to be reapplying the techniques of robustness as appropriate to that scale. And, you know, it's taken really long. It's going to be a 40 minute video. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, we'll see if anybody wants to watch it or watch a little bit of it. But one last point. The NTN approach cycling with the red, green, blue, it takes two bits. I mean, it really only needs three states, but representing it in a digital machine, you end up with two bits for it. Uh, uh, the Ringo upstate, downstate thing also takes two bits. Uh, it uses all four states, but it's a completely different model. And, you know, the, the idea of saying, you know, in the NTN thing, we take those two bits and we strap them together and treat it as a binary number. Uh, uh, and if we say that those two bits are owned by the, each individual little atom. And it makes the decision about when to go from red to green, green to blue, and so forth. It's the object-oriented approach. And, you know, all it's trying to do is sync. And, you know, so the idea of coordination, like sending messages from one end to the other, that's somebody else's job. In the Ringo approach, those bits aren't really owned by the atom that they're signaling. I mean, they're equivalent in the ring oscillator signal. They're equivalent to wire. You know, the ones at the top and the root and the tail, they're like computational elements, the jerk and the empath. But everyone else, they're just like, I'm just making my bit the same as the upstream bits. I'm making my downstate the same as my downstream bits. It's not my business. And so object-oriented, this is a thing called an intrusive data structure. And then the uh, Ringo approach uses an intrusive data structure. And it seems much more interesting to me that uh, the way to do sync, the way to do local coordination is to grant part of your resources to reflect the world around you, to let signals propagate through you uh, uh, like that. And this seems like a nice example. Either way you slice it, it's two bits. But with the object-oriented approach, it was an unending nightmare of trying to get it to deal with things when things went wrong. Again, when everything was perfect, it was beautiful. And with the uh, Ringo, with the intrusive state, it's just, it's so right that even when it's wrong, it's right. Okay. Uh, uh, the advocacy is the top-down master of the universe is good for tiny things, but it doesn't generalize. We should get over it. We should get over it now and understand and embrace the member of the team, the bottom up, the small is beautiful. Uh, um, let me stop there. Thanks for stick, sticking with me if anybody did. Uh, here's more information about the T2 Tile project itself. Uh, the T2 demos, uh, GitHub repo, it doesn't quite yet. The, the code that's up there right now is a little bit old, but it'll catch up soon. And, you know, this is all being supported by Living Computation Foundation. So, that's it. See you next time, if there is a next time. In the meantime, if you're interested in more stuff, check out the T2 Tile Project. Uh, there are sort of bi-weekly, more or less, videos there. Thanks for watching.